Any questions right off the bat, or I'm going to throw a couple of the, at these guys uh, and team. They've answered everything today. I want to know more about the labs. Can we talk more about the labs? Because I was wowed. Anybody want to chat a little bit about, so what's going to happen with labs? We can't tell you. That's why they're in the labs. Nice. Okay. We're just going to just going to stick with the secrets part. That's that's going to be it. Who can talk about? So for labs, uh, I think the the vision is really to help message what's stable versus what's experimental. So uh, we get followed pretty closely. Uh, every line of code we check in, somebody's watching. And uh, we've, we've had a couple people freak out when they've seen some stuff Mishko's doing off on the side. So the point of Angular Labs is to assure you that everything that isn't in labs is really stable and you can depend on it. Um, and everything in labs is stuff that we're still really working on. Um, most of those things, before we even start working on them, have passed through an internal design phase where the team gets to view each other's designs, ask questions, provide feedback. We go and re-edit the design. Um, and then start implementing. And so when we put something in Angular Labs, <laughs> hi, Mishko. Yay. <laughs> when we put something in Angular Labs, it's really just meant to tell you, hey, this is experimental. We're playing with it. We'd love your feedback. We're not solid on how it'll look at the end and assure you that everything not in labs is very, very stable and ready for you to use. That's a good thought, and uh, certainly more and more as, as important software, software that people depend on, is living in this open source world where very diligent people watch every single check-in and then make it in. Yeah, exactly, right? Like that, I've seen blog posts from stuff that's not even been PR'd yet. That is an interesting problem. I mean, I love that we're building software in the open, but it, it has weird consequences and sometimes confuses folks. Hand over there. This is by for Jason, I see up there, Aiden. Um, you did a presentation not too long ago regarding the build and in regard to third party libraries and doing the inline templating and piece, pieces. And I'm wondering how that's progressing. I mean, we have different two, uh, look like Basil's coming in there. We have, um, you know, I'm trying to understand where that's going. It, it will Angular CLI be part of this? Will it be gone? There's talk about that back and forth. So I was trying to understand um, what, I mean, you build it um, by hand, right? Using just bash scripts. And I think at our company, we end up using um, Angular 2 library on the uh, Yeoman. Sure. And so that's, I'm just trying to understand where that's going. And because I think that's kind of a sore point in terms of splitting things off into doing more libraries and then bringing those in. Yeah. Um, so there was a format that came out at ngconf, right? The Angular package format. And uh, we, we do have a couple of updates for it for uh, Angular 5 uh, and recommendations for library authors. Um, and then there's a couple of tools being worked on to try to make it a little bit easier to conform uh, to that format. So hopefully that stuff will make it out. Um, we, we worked with uh, the guys on like the uh, Angular Fire team. Uh, they've got a couple of tools that they built. Some of the material guys built their own tools, but we'd like to standardize them a little bit so that they're uh, publicly available. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question? Or there, there, there is a new format coming. I it's not a major update, but. Wow, that was louder than I thought. I, I think we definitely see the CLI as being the way that uh, makes it easier to ship libraries in shared code. Um, so I mean, a lot of the work that we're doing with uh, Bazel makes it so that you can have a mono repo and you can have a lot of shared code across a lot of different projects. Uh, but sometimes you still want to be shipping a library to NPM. Uh, and we want the CLI to support those sorts of use cases. And a big part of that, a big part of the reasoning for that is that really the CLI was built to make applications successful first, right? We had a bunch of, of feedback from people that they really wanted Webpack into the CLI sooner than later. And so we, we optimized for that and we got that in. It's unfortunate that Webpack is not the best tool for building those libraries to be shipped to, you know, kind of shipped to the outside world. So we're a little bit stuck in the middle at the moment, um, but I think in general we'll, we will optimize for that. Um, the other problem we have is that inside of Google we don't ship things to NPM, right? Nobody inside of Google ever ships anything out of Google. It stays in the mono repo. So it's not a thing that we dog food every day. It's not a thing that we do for ourselves very much other than our own packages, which we use a big bash script to build. So we love the people who are building uh, you know these kind of library templates and the boilerplates. We think that's awesome. And if it's you know something you have questions about, please reach out to us. But keep up on that because that's that's super awesome for us. Yeah. 
You want to run? You're faster than I am, Lion. Um, it seems like the, the syntax for like writing Angular is very different from writing Angular tests, like the decorator syntax. And I was just wondering if you were looking at using decorating, decorator syntax in tests, like at fake async, at async, instead of having to wrap everything. You want to talk about that? You should talk about that. Um, I, we would love to, except you cannot put a decorator on a function. All right. So that's a um, TC39 thing. Expand a bit on that. So we've seen a couple of examples of this. It's super cool. It, it's important to realize that annotations we use are not standard. We use them kind of, we have our own Angular flavored version of them. Um, so we, we try, because that's not really a spec or a standard or anything that we just, we just kind of made that up, right? And so we're trying not to push that to the outside world too much until we decide what's actually going to happen with that. What's that? Annotations. Well, it's just a decorator, right? Yeah, uh, exactly, right. So that, it's a thing, we've seen a couple, and I think I, like, I have the same problem with NGRX, right? NGRX uses decorators, um, and we go through a, I go through a huge amount of work on a day-to-day -day basis to keep those two things synchronized. Um, so hopefully once the decorator spec stabilizes, uh, then you know, we can start looking at using a little bit more of those. But at the moment, we're being very, very cautious and, and trying not to give him any code that isn't going to work next year. Um, so I, I'd like to add that uh, inside Google, actually, we are trying to push fake async in a big way. And we thought about decorators, but again, we didn't want to get into issues with decorators. And it wasn't uh, looking like a Jasmine test. So actually, we ended up writing a wrapper for uh, the test bed that will make it easier to uh, write fake as async tests. Uh, we'll be open sourcing that uh, in, the, in the next few months. So that should make it easier. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm just wondering, so we're trying to upgrade 1.x onto the, you know, uh, Angular. So with the ng upgrade method, you know, there's uh, apparent performance issues. Is there anything that you guys uh, can recommend or is there any plan to make, to make an easier transition using the ng upgrade method? I think uh, when you say performance issues, I'm going to assume that you're alluding to the fact that when you do a full upgrade, uh, Angular JS runs inside of the Angular's zone, and as a result, it ends up running change detection more often than if it runs by itself. And the, a uh, the answer to that is to do the ng upgrade light model of bootstrapping, where we keep Angular JS in outside of Angular zone, and then uh, Angular just runs inside of its zone by itself. So that should give you the same exact performance uh, as you have currently with Angular JS. Where can they find information to do that? My slides. Thank you. Good question. So we have. Oh. So we have an NGRX project uh, that we started a few months ago, and we just got one of the NGRX seeds, and now we're hearing all this stuff about uh, great CLI stuff, um, but the project's not in CLI. Is there any good way to move it from not CLI to CLI? Are you speaking to the schematics that the, the Narwhal folks just showed off? What's that? Were you speaking to the kind of NGRX schematics that the Narwhal folks were just showing off, or? Oh, OK. Uh, so our application uh, started off as like one of the seeds from NGRX. So it's using just like Webpack and, and stuff okay. like that. Um, so moving the entire application to a CLI would probably be a bit of surgery. Uh, if you're Webpack based and you're not doing anything crazy inside of Webpack, then typically the easiest thing to do is just generate a new Angular CLI project and then and just transpose the files over. Great. Typically, the people are nodding like that. That usually works. Awesome. Um, is that if it's something that's more complicated, then please reach out to me and I'm happy to sure. chat with you about it and we can, we can talk. Yeah, we, we moved another app from like system JS to Webpack and that was the only big problems were like uh, paths. And, and it's typically way less invasive than that even, so it should be fine to do. Awesome, thank you. Also on the uh, wiki, there should be a story referencing moving into a non-CLI project into the CLI. Uh, take a look at that. If, you, if for some reason that's not there, uh, ping me and I'll see if we can get it republished. I got one back. I see Lyman. I see Lyman in motion. Uh, all right. I have an easy question and a hard question. Which one would you like? Hard. The hard one. Okay. What What do you dislike the most about how Angular currently is that you really hope gets changed in a future version? 
that one's easy. Um, <laughs> so for me, it's the difference between NG modules and NG module factories and components and component factories. And uh, you don't see that as a CLI user, but if you're doing anything outside of the CLI, then that's quite a headache to deal with. The good news is we're getting rid of that for six. That's going away, so it'll be much easier. Um, that's mine. What else? Sorry. Just to clarify, it's not going away. It's going to be deprecated. It's going to stay around for a while. You just don't have to use it. Brad, you should know better. No, no, you're right. That's, you, you just derailed me. Well done. Well I don't done. hear Mishko's answer. Yeah, what's your answer? For what? The, the, you like? What you don't like? It's like asking, which of the part of your own baby do you not like? Yeah. <laughs> what, what part of your baby are you going to shoot off? Energy modules? Yeah. I think, I think they're very important uh, for right now. Uh, they, they solve an important problem, but I think we can do better and uh, we have some ideas on how we can remove the need for engine modules. I, I didn't realize make them optional. I didn't realize you can repeat the answer. I was gonna say the same thing, that's why I didn't say anything. <laughs> and I'll, I'll also chime in and say, zones is, a, is an area that gives me a lot of hassle. They're optional now. Yep, they're awesome now. They're optional now. If you want to opt out of zones, you can do so, and we should talk about that if that's interesting to you. And what was the easy question? <laughs> um, well, what do you think is the biggest misconception about Angular that you would love every web developer who writes, you know, two-bit Angular versus React articles to understand? <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Flynn, you should probably answer this one. You'd be a little more diplomatic than me. On that. I'd argue that that was the hard question, not the easy question. <laughs> Yep, nobody's going to touch that one, right there. So what do we wish people knew about Angular? I, I think there's a, a lot of perceived complexity in Angular, um, but we've actually done a ton of work over the last six months to make it really, really easy to get started so that you have to learn uh, new concepts uh, more as you go, right? Using the CLI to get started, using generators to scaffold out new code. Um, you don't have to learn all of Angular day one. Uh, and sometimes it can feel like it. Part of that's a little bit how we wrote our docs uh, a while ago, and I think we're going to continue to improve that. But I mean, in half an hour, someone can do an entire demo of getting an app up and running, using all the tooling, using all the, the best practices. Uh, and so it's very easy to start pushing pixels to the screen now, uh, and I think that it maybe wasn't a year ago. I, okay, I do have to say something. So the the one that bugs me, and, and this is the thing that I want everybody in this room to know, is that I read articles, and the one that, that just sticks in my brain is the one that was a couple of months ago that was like Angular, Angular 4, too little, too late, right? And that sort of makes this assumption that we're done, or that, you know, that when we got Angular 2.0 out the door that we were done, and I think that the team feels in general that we've built this foundation that's pretty awesome foundation, right? But I, I think that there are a hundred things that we want to do on top, right? And so... For us, I, I, if people are like, you've lost the race, the, the race is over. I don't think anybody on our team, anybody who uses Angular feels like that, and I think you should know that we have very interesting plans. Like the elements thing I think is really awesome, but all the other cool build stuff, you know, the, the Narwhal folks are building amazing stuff on top of what we're building. And I think that that's, that's the beginning of something really, really super cool. And I appreciate that you referenced six after we're just sort of getting our head around five, so thanks for that. Every six months. It's it, there's a pipeline, right? Same. You guys are always deciding what makes it in, what doesn't, what goes to the next version. Yeah, I don't think we've spent a ton of time at this conference talking about our, our versioning policy. Um, we're gonna keep releasing major versions, but we are extremely, extremely, extremely focused on making sure that we're not breaking you in ways that you don't predict. The, the upgrade process from two to four and four to five are both very, very easy. Most projects, and we did this actually at a meetup, most projects were updated within five minutes. Your code is going to keep working. The version number is going to change, and then at some point you're going to stop worrying about the version number. Okay. So, uh, is there an uh, easy way for uh, function interceptions in, uh, in Angular, like something like enable, disable lo uh, logging for uh, development environment or error, error handling, something like that? So DI is really good at that. I, I think that's kind of the, the big reason we use DI is that sort of use case, being able to have you know a sort of an abstract logging service that in different scenarios you provide different versions. Does that answer your question? Like that would be my answer to that. Probably be your answer to that, right, Mishka? Yeah. The, the other thing that I do is that the CLI has this very nice environments file, um, and you can set variables in there and pass that in your application and do checks against that, um, and those are all swapped out as part of the build process. 
Okay, so I do have two questions, and one's way more important than the other one. So the way more important one is, why'd you take, if AngularJS was an apple, you took an orange and decided to call it an apple and call it Angular, or it was called Angular, and then you took an orange and said, no, that's called Angular now, and then renamed Angular to AngularJS. So why not just call it something else? Why'd you just like kind of change you should redefine what the word means completely. You know, if we called it something else, we would be having the same exact conversation in the opposite direction. Would we? <laughs> I don't think so, but now. So I'll, I'll, I'll you... try and take this. So it, it's a little bit funny, because uh, about, was it six months before joining the team, yeah. I, I wrote a blog post saying that the Angular team should choose a different name for it. Uh, but I was wrong, actually. Um, Angular and AngularJS are very, very similar from a philosophical standpoint in terms of the use of de uh, declarative templates, uh, how we compile things down to JavaScript, how we try and uh, handle those pieces for you, how we have dependency injection, this very nice services layer. Um, the, the reason that it kind of had to be rebuilt, and, and Mishko or Igor, feel free to correct me, um, is that the web itself had kind of changed, right? We had come up with all these really cool concepts in AngularJS, modules and all these things that had, the web had progressed as a platform. And so if we wanted to take advantage of those things, we, we had to fundamentally rebuild kind of on top of them. So Angular is actually much simpler uh, conceptually than AngularJS was because we're relying on the modern web. So then the question is, why change the old name instead of just change, the, change it to a new name? Well, I, I don't know that we changed the old name. I think that over time, people referred to it as Angular, AngularJS, like you know the naming, the, the abbreviations, and the periods, and all of these things are different, right? But I think that... Had we known what we were going to do five years ago, we probably would have been clearer about calling it Angular JS, right, all the time. Um, I, look, we understand the frustration, I think, right? Um, but I, I mean, I do, I do have to say that I think that we made that decision what a year, eighteen months ago now, Stephen? Eighteen year, buddy? A while ago. A, a while ago. It was a while ago. Um, and I think that, by and large, we see it kind of over time moving away as being a problem, right? We work for the biggest search engine in the world, right? And we can't go to them and say, hey, rename all the AngularJS links to Angular. Um, but we see, as in general, things are moving forward that way, right? Yeah, eventually, won't forget about it, so. Yeah. Naming things is hard. If you have great ideas, let us know. <laughs> and then the less important question is, well, technically, this is more important, but the CDK, is it, is it in labs or is it released? Or uh, so we uh, the the labs thing. Yes, it is in the labs right now. It is in beta along with Angular Material, uh, but Angular Material is built on top of the CDK, and we have uh, a number of Google applications in production that are using Angular Material and are then transitively using the CDK. So it's maybe a little bit more stable than other things that would be in labs. So was it a yes when it comes to recommending it for production purposes? I would say it's going to depend on your individual project and the level of tolerance you have for changes we might make to the APIs. We, we have companies going to production with our every commit to master. Yeah. So you, you kind of choose your own adventure. <laughs> Jeremy, do you, see the, do you see the CDK going stable at the same time as material or not? So would they be different? Probably, uh, but we haven't totally decided yet. Um, it may be a little odd to say Angular Material is stable, but it depends on and is built on this library that is beta. That's a little odd. But we, try, really, we try not to do that anymore. Yeah, uh, so I, I would probably want to avoid that. Can I say, add something to it? Uh, so I think what, what the labs means is that um, if we discover something that needs to be changed in the, in the form of an API, uh, we don't have to go through the process of deprecating and um, making sure there's backwards compatible, et cetera. So we're, we're, we can short circuit in that sense, and that means that it's possible that if that happens, we, 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 you would have to have a kind of a breaking change to deal with immediately, uh, which is not the same kind of guarantees we make about something that we consider to be stable, right? Because we're saying, like, oh, if, we, if we do change something, well, you're going to get a six months notice, and there's going to be a period of time when both of the APIs will work, and so on and so forth. So it's not a question of how uh, good the quality of the code is, it's more a question of um, what kind of a support uh, we are willing to do. Not, that doesn't mean that we're like going to go off tomorrow and just change all the API to break you from the heck of it, uh, but it does mean that we, we, we cannot make that guarantee. I, 
think we're really developing a really good track record of this idea that we're not going to break you. And I, I have an example of material is still beta, right? It's it's very high quality. A lot of companies, a lot of companies are using it already. Um, and we had to make a breaking change recently, where we had to rename MD into MAT to avoid namespace conflicts uh, with Angular JS's uh, Angular JS material. Uh, but we, at the same time as making that change, we released a tool that automated that for you across your entire code base. Um, and from everything I've heard, all the developers that have used this tool, I haven't heard a single problem. And so if we can do those sorts of kind of long-term changes and understand the impact that we're having and the developer pain we might be creating and overcome that or short circuit that, that that's something we're spending a lot of time on. Yeah, and following up on that, I'll also mention, you know, a couple of people talked today about how Google has a monorepo and how there's just one version of every library. That includes the CDK and material. So if we make a big breaking change, we're the ones who have to go out and update all of the applications that are using that API. And typically we cannot even do that ourselves unless we make a backwards compatible API and then migrate people over time. And so our people ex consuming this outside of Google as well are gonna get that same experience. Hi, um, so my, my question is, is, is there a single good place to follow you guys and what's coming, new stuff that's coming down the pike? You know, just as, as someone who discovered the CLI uh, here, and would have had a lot of time saved, uh, you know, had we known about it. Um, you know, what's a good place to follow what's coming? I would say the Angular blog and the Angular Twitter channel are probably the best places to see kind of uh, our story that we're trying to tell the world in terms of, hey, look at all these cool things we're building. Here's our, our thoughts on the world. Here's uh, our thoughts on tools that we've built in the past. And here's tips on how to get the most out of them. So I think those are the two places that we, we try and be as public facing as possible in as near real time as possible. And I'm not saying this just to continue to crush Jeff Cross on Twitter followers, but uh, most of the core team, this is what we tweet and chat and talk about, right? So follow all of us on Twitter, and most of your feed will just be us talking about Angular all the time. At least me, anyway. But. You can make a list, you know, and keep you guys in your own That's column. <laughs> I wait for everything else because you talk a lot. Actually, it's a pretty steady stream of chatter going on. Yeah, and I mean, if if you're ever bored and you want to hear even more about Angular, uh, we have over 43 GDEs. So these are experts across the globe that we've certified as uh, knowing and understanding Angular and being able to communicate the concepts. They're the ones uh, presenting at a lot of conferences. We have a bunch of GDEs here uh, with us, so they are also fantastic people to to listen to, to to go see speak, to follow on Twitter. And the other place that Mishka just mentioned is our Gitter channel, where there are 9,000 odd people at the moment. Um, and those people are the people we were talking about earlier who are watching every single commit that lands and talking about it. So that's a good place to be as pretty much as up to date as you can possibly be on what's going on in Angular. Do you see us getting to a point where it's a social faux pas to talk about uh, a poll but before it's actually PR'd? No, it's we're just going to keep happening, huh? No. It's just interesting to see that dynamic go. And like, I mean, I'm, I'm making a mess of it, but really, like, we love that. It's awesome that people are so engaged. Yeah. Right? It does make you think sometimes about the way you're formatting code and what you're naming mm. your variable. <laughs> but maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> True. Branch carefully. There you go, sir. What does end of life look like for Angular JS? Is that a different team? Two questions. Uh, so yeah, we have a, a Pete Bacon Darwin uh, who's been around the Angular JS community for years and years. Yeah, uh, so he leads up the team that's taking care of Angular JS. They're still doing releases, doing maintenance, doing bug fixes, and they'll continue to do that uh, uh, according to the promise that we made when Angular was released, which is we'll do that until the majority of the community has moved. Um, as you saw on Brad's keynote this morning, that hasn't happened yet, so we're still moving forward uh, supporting Angular JS. Uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, you've got um, sessions that are conflicting happening at the same time, and we'd like to be in all of them at the same time. So the video, the video camera in there, is it going to videotape all of the sessions? Are they going to be available, for example, on YouTube, and when? Richard Campbell, I think that's Yeah, I'm question. standing right here. You should be looking at me for this one, because this is my fault. Uh, and you know, it was, there was an energy about should we just make one room and stay with one room the whole time, but it ends up cutting a lot of content. And for me, as a guy who has to pay the bills around here, you should have brought two friends. Because <laughs> then you could have been in all the rooms. No, we don't have camera teams for every room. They don't. 
That's, that's reality. Uh, I am, uh, Lyon? But they're already being posted from here today. There's already four. Yes. Now, the, this room today, we are the, the, the sessions are going up on YouTube, you know, as we speak. So that's happening right now. And again, I will be gathering materials as speakers are willing to release them wherever they put them so you'll have access to those. But uh, no, I can't, uh, I can't record them all. I can't stream them all. And, uh, and I can't get you to go to them all. I've often considered the idea that we could make an ADD room, just a room with like a video feed from all of them and like a headset where you switch between channels so you can watch three sessions at once because I've met people like that. <laughs> and that's why I called it the ADD room. Like we could go, we could do that, but uh, I don't know if it's actually a good idea. Like I don't want to encourage the ever decreasing attention span feature that we could watch them all at once. But I, I, don't, I don't have a mechanism for that. And it's an interesting conversation to have as to how far we go down that path. Michael. The camera's only today. No cameras tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow as we break out and the, the, the rooms get shuffled around a bit, it's the end of the, today was the camera day and stop being posted to YouTube. Okay, question. Um, there's a couple issues open against the router um, related to scroll position and how that's handled uh, moving forward and backward and, and whatnot. Um, is, what's the priority on that? Is there any way to raise that priority and then Route reuse strategy, is that going to stay experimental? Is that going away? Is there any plans that are, you know, that can be made public here? Um, sure. I'm looking at Victor because I'm kind of working with Victor on this a little bit right now. Um, so for the scrolling, uh, that's coming soon. Um. <laughs> A, yeah, that's coming soon, and that is that is uh, in terms of features. I think that's probably the highest priority feature um, for the router. Uh, I, I don't I don't think it'll land in five because we're already in RC, um, so it would land in a soon update. Five one. Yeah, like five uh, probably in five one. No commitments. Future. <laughs> All right. From it, my perspective, I think it's just been escalated. <laughs> No, it's, it, it has been escalated uh, already. So, uh, and then on the route reuse strategy, um, yeah, currently experimental. There'll probably be some updates on that soon too. Yeah. Uh, kind of piggybacking on that, um, where does the Angular team really see like opportunities for um, people who maybe have Angular experience but never contributed? Where would you guys like need help? Where would you see uh, possibilities for contributing? So I'll uh, I'll jump in I'll jump in first on this one uh, on the Angular Material repo we have a label called Good for Community Contribution it is a really good place to start it has some easy docs issues and then scaling up to more complex like bug fixes and component features and you don't have to actually know a ton about the internals of Angular. Like you would have to if you contributed to the core itself. So if you're just familiar with Angular, uh, the material repo is a great place to start. We have a similar tag on Angular Angular called Community Hotlist, which we could do a better job of using. So yeah, Stephen's right. We we are aware that it's a little challenging right now to contribute, especially to Angular Core. So we're working on some ideas to make this easier. Uh, we're also working on our documentation side, so Angular IO slash docs, to make this uh, the entry point for you to contribute. Uh, we're going to be adding some features in the next uh, few months that'll make this a little easier. Hoping for things like editing in line and uh, being able to have contributor tags on all of our docs. Uh, so be looking at those for easy ways, and we'll probably blog about this when we get to that point. Uh, but for now, I think docs are a good place. It helps you actually get to know uh, Angular better and then learn a little bit more about the intricacies so you can start contributing to the core features. And I would also add that we're really looking at other ways to increase the uh, API surface that you can contribute to. So things like schematics are a real example of that, where maybe you don't feel comfortable jumping in and helping out uh, the Angular Angular repo, but you could build a schematic, right, that, that helps build better Angular project out of the box. I was just going to say, Brad and I had, uh, we were rehearsing last night in my suite, and uh, one of the ideas we had was to open up to the community to build schematics for your favorite library. So for example, I was saying I wish we had a schematic for Angular Material and Angular Fire and NGRX and all these other things that if you could just say ng generate blah, right? So if you have your favorite library, a great way to get started would be looking at doing schematics for that and then everybody else gets the benefit of it. 
I'm just gonna add that <clears throat> one of the great ways uh, to contribute is help us with issues. Um, we have lots of people from the community that are looking through our issues and helping us reproduce uh, some reports uh, from other people that are not maybe as clear or as definite as, as they could be. Um, point out uh, easy answers on the issue tracker and this will help us uh, spend our time on the actual engineering problems and, and be more efficient in processing the issues. So this is a great way to contribute as well. Um, a lot of people just mentioned schematics. Uh, I'm giving a talk about schematics on Thursday if you're just hearing schematics and have no idea what that is. Um, yeah, I'm sure most of you can raise your hands on that. Um, so Docs for Schematics is another great place uh, to um, get involved. Uh, there's a community, I think it's Community Help Wanted uh, tag on the CLI repo if you want to look there. Uh, things as small as one character changes to implementing features. So a wide variety of uh, issues there that you can assist with. Yeah, I think Rob mentioned our Gitter channel uh, earlier. Like, that's also a great place to come and help out. Um, a great way to learn more about Angular is trying to solve other people's problems um, with Angular. So, you can always use more people there. That's how, I, that's how I got on this team, was I sat in IRC for two years and answered everybody's questions and then learned how it works. And there you go. All right, go ahead. Um, hi, yes. Um, I had, it's kind of like a two part question. Uh, one part would be is, uh, what are your thoughts on looking towards an agnostic way for CMS systems or if you're going to be looking at doing um, an Angular CMS and I've already asked a couple of you guys already about, you know, dynamically communicating with an, uh, an external CMS, uh, particularly on the fly along with uh, uh, Angular Universal kind of uh, dynamic and kind of on the fly stuff. So we're working a lot with different CMSs kind of across the board, and it, it's definitely possible to do that today, actually. Um, if you go to nba.com, they are already doing this. They're a Drupal-based site that is bootstrapping Angular dynamically um, as it comes. Um, so it, it's definitely a use case we're spending a lot of time on. Um, I think Rob talked a little bit about that today as well in terms of our interop story, because uh, in general, we want to help you write Angular code, and then we want to help your, you reach more people with your code. And so um, having this embeddable use case is something we're thinking a lot about. Uh, the, the second part that you, you mentioned is actually much, much harder, is how do we server-side render parts of Angular? And, and so that, I, I don't have the answer for that yet. I think that's something we're still talking to people about. And so if you have needs around that, definitely uh, help us understand your use case, and then it'll get more attention. Hi, could you expand upon the concept you mentioned about having a monolithic repository for all your applications? Because it sounds really counterintuitive. Like, what's the benefit? That, this is your thing. I can take this one, or Alex can also help. Um, so this, this is an approach where you, you, all of your code base is in a single repository. Um, you can see this uh, in the Angular Angular repository, where we have all of the packages live in this single repository. Uh, we have a build system that knows how to build everything across uh, the repository, and we have a test suite that tests everything across all of the packages. Um, this is concept that comes um, from many bigger projects at Google. This is basically how Google works. At Google, we don't have lots of small repositories. We just have one giant repository into which tens of thousands of engineers at Google contribute to. And I know this sounds crazy. It, it takes a while to rethink about, uh, rethink many of the, the practices and, and how the software is built. But one of the great benefits uh, is that you have a single place where all the source code is present. And you have a revision and history of all the changes that happen in this uh, repository. So you can build your backend, you can build your front end, you can build all the tooling, compilers that build your backend, uh, compilers that build your compilers, everything can be built from this single repository. And this gives you the, the hermesity and repeat, repeatability uh, of the setup uh, that both Alex and I were talking about. Does that help understand? Sure. I mean, here, there's, here's, a, here's a comparison, right? Who in this room has had to deal with a scenario where you're shipping two things to NPM that depend on each other and you're fixing one and the other one has to come alongside and has to be released at the same time? 
that's the kind of thing that we don't deal with at Google, right? We don't deal with having to sync up the right version or make sure one releases and we're not, we just don't deal with it. Um, and that, I will say, coming from open source fairly recently, I thought it was totally bonkers and I thought it was a totally crazy idea and I am a complete convert now. Like, it, I would not do anything any other way, I don't think. If you're interested in finding out more about it, Google actually published a white paper to the ACM about its monorepo uh, a while ago. I don't remember exactly when. Um, and I retweeted it very very recently. If you look at my own Twitter feed, you'll find it. <laughs> and what's that Twitter handle? I'm Gelborn. So there is one thing that you might find counterintuitive, which is that a lot of us assume that the repository is the place where you hold the permissions for who can edit what. And so if you work in a big company, people can be um, controlling about the repository and they don't want you to, to look at their code and certainly don't want you to make changes to it. Um, I think there's an organizational problem there of being permissive about, you know, if I own a library and you consume it, then you should be able to make fixes and, and send them to me. Um, but there's also a missing piece, which is to, to encode those permissions as files in that Mono repo. So we use something called pull approve on the Angular repo, which lets us um, not just say who's allowed to change what, but also who has to do code reviews when a change is made in a certain directory. Um, and so if you don't have a system like that, then the mono repository would give you the downside that it's much harder to make sure that the right person is looking at the right change in the right directory. Um, so I think look into pull approve if you use GitHub. Um, there are probably similar systems uh, if you don't. Oh, GitHub has it built in now. What I said is wrong. Well, it, it is built into GitHub. It's a, it's a little different, though. Uh, it, it has some weird, interesting behaviors. Okay. All right. Um, what are the most important use cases that your team is working on right now, and why are they so important? I mean, I'll speak for myself, and I think that the, the sort of CMS embedded, you know, that this sort of not Angular is the whole application case, I think is incredibly important. I think it brings out the reach of the project. Um, and then CLI, right, like to me are the, the two most important. But are you whispering at me somewhere? Because <laughs> <laughs> Jules is uh, whispering reactive. So uh, one of the things okay. we would like to do is to allow uh, libraries like Rx to be more um, reactive in the way you write your applications. Uh, so that probably means that you could use uh, observables more in, syn in syntax inside of the templates as a first class citizens. Um, inputs might be reactive rather than just uh, basic parameters, et cetera. This also kind of transitions to being able to um, trigger on change detection without the need of the zone, so that if you have a reactive stream and stuff just shows up, that, that you can just automatically know like it's time to do change detection. Um, so the reactivity and the management of state in a way that doesn't require a global check is kind of on top of my priority list. Yeah, thank you. I think for version five, we spend a lot of time looking into making things simpler, um, but also smaller. So we did a lot of research into, you know, where does the bloat come from? What can we do about it? And over the last six months, we spent many efforts. We, we, we took on many efforts across many different projects, Material, Angular, CLI, um, to shrink the size. And, and this is one of the things that is going to come out as, as version 5. Um, Along with that, the simplicity, especially in the setup, um, the way the code is compiled is, is much more simpler now, easier to debug, uh, and it gives us more flexibility to do things like um, attach, generate the code uh, to your code, which is something that's gonna make it easier um, for, for Angular developers and down the road, which is something we couldn't do before. Um, yeah. If you didn't just hear your use case, don't worry. <laughs> we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of use cases. I mean, effectively, every issue in our GitHub repository is advocating or has a voice for a use case for using Angular. And there are millions of Angular developers, and we are worried about most of them. So. <laughs> Do you see a workbox CLI becoming the standard for writing Angular PWAs? No. Um, so I talk a lot with Jeff Posnick, who works on Workbox, and we share strategies on service workers and stuff like that. Um, Workbox works really well with Angular today. Uh, I'm not sure if you noticed, but we are uh, publishing our own version of service worker as RC with uh, 5.0, and it will be released with 5.0. 
Um, and we've kind of gone, gone beyond what Workbox can do a little bit and integrated it more into Angular. So you register the service worker by installing an ng module in your application. And you actually get services that you can inject and communicate with it and get notified about updates or ask the service worker to go do things. Um, and we've also kind of taken a lot of care into making sure that we're not going to break your application in some of the weird and interesting ways that you can do if you, you know, use service workers incorrectly. So um, I think that Workbox is nice if you're going to, if you're the kind of person who kind of wants more control over things and you want to set up the service worker yourself. We're really trying to design our Angular service worker to be the kind of thing that you can drop into any application and it should behave um, fairly reasonably in, in all use cases. Is it fair to say Workbox is like React and your service worker is to go with Angular? Like assemble your own comes out of the box? Yes, but you, you said that, not me. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Have we missed anything? Oh, one up from here. This wasn't uh, mentioned today, but it is about Angular. And uh, I may be doing things wrong, but I kind of want to understand the purpose or the case to use Angular Forms. So it just seems very redundant, or it just seems like it's a lot of just writing a bunch of code that's extra to maintain. And or I see, it, I mean, it was decoupled from doing model validations or creating forms through the model. I'm kind of wondering why, why create forms? Why is it decoupled? Why do all the extra work of creating those forms and using form groups and form arrays and just not having it on the model itself? I mean, forms are hard. Is the short answer to that? Like, forms are are ridiculously hard at scale. I think that yeah. I personally have written the ridiculous validation loops in AngularJS that made my head hurt, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about it is it's, it's a layered API, and so the thing is is that like we have this core uh, control value accessor API that is really what all of the forms APIs talk to, right? So if you don't like the way that we're opinionated on forms, then it's designed in such a way that you could design your own interface on top, or not, right? Like just skip them entirely and, and don't use forms. Um, one of the things that changed between JS and Angular, right, was moving ng model out, and ng model sort of moved into forms. Um, and really, that's because ng model, like the the model that we use in Angular today, right, with this kind of one-way data flow and, and all that, ng model is kind of doesn't fit into that model straight away, right? So we had to kind of pull it out, rethink about it, and then and really. If I'm writing a reactive app with NGRX, for example, like I don't use Angular slash forms. I'd be using reactive forms. I would never use ng model with a reactive app, right? And so we made this decision that there are different ways to use forms, different ways you're going to want to assemble them. And so we pulled those pieces out, made them separate pieces so you could kind of assemble them as necessary. So getting into more some specifics, the, the forms module, I think more than anything else, gives you a consistent way to approach forms for components that may be written by different people or different teams. So there is a, a common API that everyone can use for saying, this is how we know when the component is touched. This is how when we know it is submitted or when it's valid or invalid, they can all kind of follow the same pattern. And so it makes it easy to consume components that are all kind of following the same uh, standard instead of everybody kind of inventing their own way of doing forms. Okay. Well, thank you for the answer. I just, I just wasn't sure how, how pushed it was because when I was doing the training, it seemed like forms was the way the team was pushing. Like plus when you're using forms, use the forms uh, module. So that's what I wasn't sure of, and I was wondering why. If you're using forms and collecting data, it is a fantastic way to apply validation kind of across the board in a very consistent uh, declarative way. But certainly that's good feedback, that if it, if it felt like it was you know, pushed too early or you, you, know, you didn't understand why you, ne you need it, then that's good feedback for us in the docs team so that we can have it think about that and maybe better explain it in the documentation. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, Jeff. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Jeff from California. Hi, Jeff. Hi, hi Jeff. Um, do you have any benchmarks of large applications? I don't actually know the answer, so it's not like a setup question, but do you have any benchmarks of uh, running Angular CLI against large, large code bases uh, compared with Bazel against, in its current state with, uh, against large code bases? Or if you don't have real benchmarks, what do you think the... We did, uh, we did start creating that benchmark, but we couldn't really make it apples to apples because um, it was still slightly too early to have a, a Bazel dev server that handled Angular app. Um, I think we could finish that benchmark today. Um, I don't remember what the numbers are, but um, 
uh, we actually the CLI team is already looking at um, ways to split up uh, the compilation um, so that uh, that benchmark could drive us to make those kind of improvements. I don't think it's clear. Yet. We have a couple of different proposals whether we would use Bazel to do that or whether the CLI would do something in the medium term to split up the compilation to speed things up. Thank you. I don't see a question right back there. You got one there? You're first. Okay. Um, question about all the things working together. Um, universal, service worker, flex layout, Angular Fire 2, material. Is that something that you guys have some confidence in all of that playing together well in 5.0? Yes. Yeah, I agree. Is there a mm back there? Mm? No, I mean, like, I, I'm not sure about the, what, why is there a hesitance uh, about this? Well, so far they haven't. Um, you know, there was changes recently from Material and Flex Layout to support Universal, and Universal's been changing, and... So this is why we set up this RC period uh, for all of the major releases. So we have one month to polish all of the, all of the libraries. Um, this is the time when we are integrating everything together, making sure that it works. Um, Angular IO has been a great help in this because it's the place where we test CLI, the service worker, the core of the framework, um, material design, CDK, make sure that all of that stuff is, is working well. Um, and we're going through this process right now. So yeah. we're pretty close to having everything working. I'll also mention, you, you specifically mentioned Flex Layout. We are having some issues with Flex Layout with Angular 5. And what's holding us up on getting that resolved is um, we're having some issues making, uh, dealing with some of the breaking changes in terms of uh, updating some of the, the Google apps. And it's something that the most people outside of Google wouldn't have to worry about. It's just a particular nuance to our, uh, the way we have things set up internally. And we're, once we get that sorted out, everything will be uh, better with Flex Layout, which um, Flex Layout is still beta as well. So uh, we're working on it. Uh, we, we're trying to use um, material design for the web, but also Ionic for a mobile device native app. And we want to, to put the same application on the web and, download, and being to downloadable. I was wondering if you can use one code base and load both material design and Ionic in there. But then when you open it on, a, on the web, you don't have the Ionic overhead. But at the same time, you can download it on your phone and you, you won't have the material design overhead. Uh, is it, do you guys recommend for performance doing two separate apps? Or can we combine them in one app? And is there other considerations for us to consider? Like, I don't know how uh, the PDF, PWA concept is new to us. Is, is that an alternative that we can um, employ to do a downloadable app? And, uh, um, what do you guys think? So, so actually, the, the, when you use Angular today, right, you, you uh, import from Angular Core to create components. But when you bootstrap your Angular application, you import from the platform, right? You either use platform browser or platform server or platform web worker. Um, and the idea of that is, is more or less exactly what you're talking about, right, at the kind of low level. And that on different platforms, you want to provide different sets of services, right? Um, I don't think that it's a good idea to necessarily ship set, certainly two sets of components in one application that you're only going to view one set of those components, right? Um, I think a good Angular application, most kind of well-written Angular applications are very heavy on the service side. That is the non-UI side, everything that's talking to servers and you know, making API calls. Um, sort of, I don't know, 80, 20, something like that. And so the idea would be that rather than trying to kind of shoehorn or flip everything out dynamically at runtime, you know, share the code that you can share, and that is your services. All the kind of common code should be 80% of your code base, and then it's easy to take 20% and do you know, UI layers that are different. Um, it, that's just my personal experience. Like, I don't know that, that I'm speaking for the Angular team there, but I've always found conditional to be a, a significantly harder thing to do than composing you know, applications out of smaller units. And I think, again, Jeff and Victor talked a little bit about that today, where you have a whole bunch of lib code, which is kind of agnostic to any you know, material or ionic or whatever, um, and then you assemble that into, into different applications. Uh, maybe Jeremy could speak to the styling end of that better. But. 
I'm terrible at CSS. So, uh, so I don't actually know a ton about Ionic, so it's hard for me to say. Uh, I think Rob's answer in general is pretty much what you want to do is share what you can and just create different deployment surfaces for the, the UI you want on whatever deployment platform. I also want to mention uh, Sonny's here uh, from the Ionic team. And you can take a look at his talk on Thursday, uh, where he's going to be talking about six different ways to build or to build six applications at once, I believe, is the title of the talk. So take a look at that on Thursday. Thank you. Uh, I'll also jump in and just answer the PWA part of your question. Um, it really depends on what your use case is for being in the App Store. Um, if you're looking at accessing, you know, really kind of specific device APIs, um, or you need exposure in the search in the App Store, then native application is probably better. But if you just want to be an icon on their home screen and kind of load and, and be as performant as a native application, I think PWA could be a great answer to that. All right. Well, when there, when there, I'll go to get this one first. Uh, okay. Uh, we have an application, and it uh, will be a very customizable application. Which mean, means uh, each customer maybe need 10, 20 percent of customization. We need to do what is solution for f Angular in uh, Angular in front end. What's the best approach? Because I asked. Uh, uh, Dan yesterday, uh, and uh, he told it's not yet in, ang in Angular. You can not do it with Angular. What do you think? What is? So m I, I guess the, the, the short answer to that question is, is if you think about how we do lazy loading in the router today, right? You, you have a sort of a shell application, a top level application, and then as you route around the application, you go load modules lazily, right? And then they are sort of instantiated and they plug into your application. That works for routing and for lots of applications, that works absolutely fine. We do hear from a lot of people though, and this is, this is probably for me the most common thing that I hear when I go about talk to big companies, is they want a similar kind of mechanism to be able to do arbitrary lazy loading of pieces of functionality, right? Whether that's based on some JSON schema or you go to a database or whatever, right? You have a finite set of components and some list of them and you can go fetch them. So we hear that a lot. Um, right now it's, it's pretty difficult to do outside of the router. Um, we have heard that loud and clear and I think it's one of the things that we will be working on almost as soon as we get back. Do you want to talk about that at all? But in general we think that the lazy loading of the modules is the kind of mechanical way to do it. Um, we'll make that easier in the CLI and then how you manage that, right? Your permissions and who's allowed to see what kind of is above the scope of what Angular does. But certainly ng modules being lazy loaded in the same way that the router does is the way that we see kind of bringing in that sort of functionality. Uh, under the umbrella of ABC, um, we do have a, another way internally at Google to deliver the same application but looks a little bit different for different users. Uh, we use that in particular for A-B testing so we can roll out an experiment in some UI and give it to some percentage of users and, and verify um, whether that's better. Um, we have a lot of work to do to figure out how that design could be shipped externally. Um, but at the same time, we also want to simplify the way that we do that in internally at Google. So I think we're trying to find um, the right surface to make a converged solution there that we could, we could that Angular would support both internally and externally. It's probably late, late-ish next year though before we get the design figured out. Question, do you have any Angular case studies that relate to enterprise customers, and do you plan to put those on angular.io at some point? We already started doing that. I don't know if you noticed, but our, our blog now, every now and then, brings in a, a third party that talks about their choice of Angular, or their use of Angular at scale. Um, so we, we are doing that. Uh, happy to talk more about that if you want to come up and chat later. Uh, we're going to start taking drink tickets for each additional question, though, from you. <laughs> uh, I, I would also say the Narwhal folks have a lot of experience working with enterprise companies, and I'm sure they'd be happy to, to share some of their experiences. And if you have a use case or a case study that you think would be awesome on the Angular blog, you can let us know. We would love that. All right, I think we're ready for a, oh, I got a hand right back there, Ryman. That's your side. You get to run. And is one in the middle as well? Yeah. There. And okay. we, we don't disappear after the Q&A. No, no, it's, but. <laughs> we're on we Twitter, said, we're. We said till five, I know you're thirsty. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go till five. 
Um, <laughs> so when is material going to come out of beta, and what are we kind of waiting on to stabilize? Yeah, so uh, I was actually going to say this earlier when uh, someone asked, what are you working on right now? Um, that. <laughs> uh, so if you've been watching our repo, you may have seen we've had more API changes than usual lately, and that is because we are trying, we are like literally right now trying to finalize any API changes we want to make or any larger behavioral changes we want to make before we get into a RC and then a stable period. So it should be relatively soon. Um, I'm not, no exact dates, never promise an exact date, but uh, we're, we're actively working on that um, right now. That's the, our main focus. Uh, hi, it's me again. <laughs> so, I, I believe Rob talked about the Angular elements. So, I was just thinking, like, if I understand the thought behind it, but what would be a use case when you don't really utilize the framework? Because that's the idea, right? The use case, the typical use case for Angular elements would be something like a, you know, old jQuery site, and but you don't want to import the whole Angular application, you know, all, all Angular fr framework, and just sort of like utilize that. Other than that, is there any other use case for that, possibly in CMS or? So I, I can give you kind of three, right? For me, what? Uh, I just wanted to jump in and say I love the premise of this question. Why would you not want to use Angular for anything? <laughs> like. <laughs> Um, so for me, like I, I think I put them on the slides, but there's there's a few cases, right? So the CMS case, and uh, a gentleman over here made a was talking about CMSs, right? Where you want to be able to, kind of for me, think about layout and the the logic of those components separately, right? So. Conceivably, you could write, you know, widgets this way. So the one we always use is date pickers. Um, you know, we could build a date picker in Angular and use it anywhere. Whether that's a modern application, right? Because most frameworks today will support web components. And I'm, I'm not saying go use a different framework. Um, but if you're at a company that's using them, right, there should be no reason that if you, you like Angular, you're productive with Angular, you should not be able to play in harmony with other things, right? We don't live in a kind of one framework world anymore. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you could take entire applications, you know, your gigantic web application that you're building today, and package it up as a custom element. There's not a huge amount of extra use in that. Um, one of the cases that actually there's a very old issue on the GitHub repo that talks about pe people being able to pass in attributes to the root component. And it's one of the most kind of contentious issues I've ever read on GitHub. People are really, really mad about it. Um, they want to be able to pass in like an ID key in HTML, right, and have the app pick it up. Uh, custom element solves that problem. You know, it allows you to communicate with the Angular application from the DOM, uh, which is not something you can really do today. So it uh, really kind of opens up a lot of places where even if you're not using Angular as the consumer of the component, and that's the important difference, right? Angular is, you're authoring it with Angular, but the consumer could use it anywhere. Anywhere that the web exists, that component could be used, whether it's a widget or an app or somewhere in between. Buy me a beer later tonight, and I can, I'll talk about this for hours, so, you know. <laughs> uh, and this team will be in the expo hall right after this, so if you do want to get a little more one-on-one -on -one with them and have a chat over a, a, the beverage of your choice, it is 5 o'clock, and that means uh, time to go to the expo hall. So a big hand for our panel.